Now, won't you please take the word of God and turn to 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 2, page 236 in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 2. In the last couple of weeks, church leaders in South Africa, through their spokesman of the South African Council of Churches, claim that South Africa, and I quote, South Africa is inches away from becoming a mafia state. Their condemnation was based on evidence of galloping greed, rampant corruption, attempts at state capture, abuse of power, disregard for the Constitution, flagrant injustice, moral decline, and disregard for the poor, all stuff we've heard about over and over and over again. The bottom line explanation for this state of affairs, I think, is summed up well in the final verse of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21, verse 25. It says, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. And that's kind of what we see happening. And when God and his word are pushed aside, when there's no king in that sense, and everybody just does as they see fit, then we find ourselves where we are. And we saw this in the hideous events in the last chapters of the book of Judges, chapters that Ryan opened up for us in our first message in the series in Samuel. And we're seeing some of those things playing out uh, in our own country. It was into this very dark and decadent context in about 1050 BC that Samuel was born. He was born at a time when Israel had no king and when everyone did as they saw fit. Israel was facing a leadership crisis. It was facing a spiritual crisis. They had entered the land years before under the leadership of Joshua, the great strength and great victory. But then the people of God lost their way. They lost their way spiritually, they lost their way politically, they lost their way militarily. And Judges chapter two, verse 10 explains why. It says, after Joshua and his generation, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. That was the, that was the heart of the problem. A generation who didn't know God. A generation who had forgotten the great works that God had, did, had done on behalf of his people in bringing them out of Egypt and bringing them into the promised land and settling them there. The book of Judges concludes with that series of hideous stories that uh, I think shocked some of you from what I heard. Uh, some of you never read Judges. You didn't know that stuff was in the Bible. And yet that was the time into which Samuel was born. And sadly, it was also a time of real decline and darkness amongst the people of God, in the church, amongst the spiritual leaders of Israel. Samuel, you remember, was a miracle child, born in answer to the fervent prayer and solemn promise of his godly mother, Hannah. And after he was weaned, which would have been about three, four years old, Hannah fulfilled her promise and the text says that she brought the boy to Eli. Eli was the priest, the spiritual leader of Israel in a place called Shiloh. And when she and her husband Elkanah presented young Samuel to the Lord, this is what she said. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. His whole life will be given over to the Lord. And after handing over 
young Samuel and one cannot begin to understand the sacrifice that that must have been for Hannah. After handing him over, she prayed that marvelous prayer that we find in chapter two, verses one to 10. And then we read in verse 11, then Elkanah and presumably Hannah went home to Ramah. So the boy Samuel was left to grow up as a little apprentice priest under the tutorship of Eli in a place called Shiloh. You remember Shiloh was where the tabernacle was first set up when the Israelites came into the promised land under, under the leadership of Joshua. Shiloh was a place where significant national assemblies were held. It was kind of the capital city at that point, and it was certainly the religious center of Israel. And so Samuel, the boy Samuel, grew up in that context. But Shiloh was also a rotten place. There were scoundrels in Shiloh. Eli's two priest sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were the chief scoundrels. And in chapter 2, verses 12 to 36, the, chapter, the passage we're going to look at this morning, what we're going to see is a contrast between the scoundrels and their lifestyle and Samuel. First Samuel is full of contrasts, and this is one of the main ones. And this passage is, at the same time, disturbing and encouraging. And so my hope this morning is that you will be disturbed. Good to be disturbed. And I hope that we will also be encouraged, because we need that encouragement. There are four lessons I want to draw out of this passage this morning, and the first is this. God sees sin in the church. Verses 12 to 17 make this plain. We see this contrast as we move from verse 11 to verse 12. Look at the text. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Eli's sons were wicked men. The 2011 version of the NIV says, Eli's sons were scoundrels. That's where I got the title from. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Or the ESV puts it, they did not know the Lord. How tragic to have words like that describe the spiritual leaders of God's people. Scoundrels, wicked men who did not know the Lord. They were in positions of spiritual leadership. But they had no relationship with God. They were unconverted. They were unregenerate. They were far from God. And although they were handling holy things, responsible for doing holy work, caring for God's holy people, his set apart people of Israel, they were not holy themselves. Their hearts had been not cha hadn't been changed. And because their hearts hadn't been changed, their behavior was ungodly. And the, the root always gives rise to the fruit. And so look at, read with me from verse 13, and we'll see the, the fruit of unholy hearts, people who didn't know God. Now it was the practice, verse 13, now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said, let the fat be burned up first and then take whatever you want, the servant would then answer, no, hand it over now, and if you don't, I'll take it by force. 
Huh. Not content with the specified portions of the sacrifices given to the priests that had been outlined in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Eli's sons would take for themselves whatever they wanted. They would send their servants and say, dig that three-pronged fork into the pot and whatever you get out, that's what I want. But then they grew tired of that. They didn't particularly like boiled meat. And so they would go to the offerer of the sacrifice before the meat was placed in the pot and they would demand raw meat. And they would demand raw meat with fat on it. And the Levitical prescription was specifically that the fat belonged to God. That was to be burnt on the altar as a fragrant offering to God. But no, no, no. They required the fat. And if the protester and if the, the offerer of the sacrifice protested, knowing what God required, and said, No, no, let me burn the fat first, they would say, Give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. That was what was happening around the sacrifices in the temple of Shiloh. And their actions proved that they had no regard for God. Their actions proved that they didn't know God. Their actions proved that these spiritual leaders were like the culture around them, doing what they saw fit rather than what God's word had said they should do. But that was not all. Look at verse 22. They slept with the woman who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. These priests were not only greedy, but they were immoral, using their position of power, of spiritual authority to get involved sexually with the woman who served at the church. And so here we see spiritual leaders who knowingly violated the word of God by being greedy and immoral and abusive and unloving, and they yielded to the three chief sins that spiritual leaders faced. You know what they are? The three chief areas of temptation, that trinity of temptations, money, sex, and power. Richard Foster wrote a book by that title, Money, Sex, and Power. And if you study the fall of spiritual leaders around the world, you will discover that invariably their fall is around one or more of those three things, money, sex, and power. One of the things that has struck me over the past year or so as I've driven around the city and I tend to use Oxford Road quite a bit to pick up my grandson from school, you see placards on the lampposts and I cannot begin to tell you how many times the placard has highlighted the sin of some pastor. Pastor does this, pastor does that. It's been all over the news in the last year, even to the point where the government has felt to get the need to get involved to correct some of the extreme abuses in some local churches. Even this week, there was a placard that read, T.B. Joshua tricked me. If you don't know who T.B. Joshua is, it's probably a good thing, but he's one of the big hot shots. Now the verdict is on their conduct is given in verse 17. Look at it. This sin of the young men was very great in God's sight for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Let those words sink in for a moment. Those words in God's sight. And that's the thrust of these opening verses of this section. God sees sin in the church. Everything that happens in the church, whether it's in the lives of leaders in their personal life, whether it's in the way they conduct themselves in committee meetings, everything that happens in the church, in the lives of leaders and members, happens in God's sight. Hebrews reminds us that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I find that incredibly sobering. Bill Arnold, 
Methodist Bible commentator wrote this, there is something about throwing oneself into the everyday affairs of the church, into the routine business of doing church work that is deceptive. It soothes our conscience and make us, makes us feel that we're in the right state spiritually. But proximity to God's work is no substitute for submission to God's grace. As Hophni and Phinehas warn us, it is possible to handle the things of God regularly. Bear in mind, they officiated at the worship in the tabernacle. It's possible to handle the things of God regularly and to fail to have a heart that is sensitive to God's will. In fact, it may be those of us who daily handle the things of Christ that are the ones most prone to forget their significance and fall into a laissez-faire approach to the gospel of God. I find that a solemn warning to me as one who daily is involved in the life of the church. And regardless of the extent to which you're involved in the life of the church, you need to guard your heart because God sees sin in the church. Then the second thing we discover in this passage is that God expects spiritual leaders to confront sin. God expects spiritual leaders to confront sin. Indeed, he expects all of us to, but spiritual leaders have a particular responsibility. Verse 22, look at the text. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about those wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Now, when Eli heard about what his sons were doing, he did the right thing by confronting them. He said, why do you do such things? And he was right in calling their deeds wicked. Why are you doing such wicked things? Sometimes we're not very good at calling things what they are. It's not fashionable to call people wicked. It's fashionable to call them weak. But he called a spade a spade. Furthermore, he was right in warning them about the seriousness of their sin. He said to them, and I quote from the message, if you sin against another person, there's help, God's help. But if you sin against God, who's around to help you? In other words, you're saying, this is serious. You're sinning against God. Now, when there's open sin in the church, in the lives of the people of God, God expects the spiritual leaders to, to do something about it when they hear about it or when they see it. We're not to ignore it. We're not to pretend that it's not there. We need to confront it. We need to call, what, call it what it is. We need to call wickedness, wickedness. And we need to warn people of the consequences of their sin. But confrontation and warning must always be with restoration in mind. That's the purpose of it. There's so many commands in the New Testament calling on all believers and especially church leaders to be faithful to one another in confronting serious sin when it's seen. It needs to be confronted for the good of people. Galatians chapter six, verse one would be one example. I could cite many texts. Brothers and sisters, Paul says, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, not you who are perfect, but you who are walking with God, you who are spiritual should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. I have that responsibility. 
you have that responsibility. If you're a community group leader and you see someone in your community group getting into difficulty with sin, don't ignore it. You have a responsibility to play a role of restoration with gentleness and humility. Now, how did these boys respond? How did they respond to their father's rebuke? Verse 25 says they didn't listen. Now, why didn't they listen? Look at the text. Look with me at verse 25. It says, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Dale Davis says this. We do well to allow verse 25 to percolate in our minds. It's easy to read it too hastily. As if it said that Hophni and Phinehas did not listen to Eli and consequently the Lord decided to put them to death. But the text doesn't say that. It says Eli's sons did not listen to him because or for the Lord had decided to put them to death. Hophni and Phinehas' resistance was not the reason for God's judgment, but the result of his judgment, a perfectly just judgment. We cannot divorce verse 25 from the previous account of Hophni and Phinehas' impudence and immorality. In the light of verse 20, in that light, verse 25 says that for their persisting rebellion, the Lord decided to put them to death and therefore they had not listened to Eli's plea. So the text teaches that someone can remain so firm in their rebellion that God will confirm them in it, so much so that they will remain utterly deaf to and unmoved by any warning of judgment or plea for repentance. That's a bit heavy for a Sunday morning. But it is really important that we get it. Because if you are persisting in some serious sin, despite the protests of your conscience, despite the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, you need to be afraid. God may say to you, enough is enough. And as part of his judgment, harden you in that position so that you will not even hear or be able to respond to appeals for repentance and returning to God. Now before I leave this point, let me, let's come back to Eli for a few minutes. Old Eli. Although he verbally rebuked his sons, he took no decisive action when they kept on doing what they'd been doing. He could have at least removed them from the priest's office. That was his right. He had power to do that. Oh, he couldn't stop them from committing immorality, but he could have stopped them from committing immorality as priests by removing them from the office of priest, but he didn't. He failed to act. He talked, but he failed to act. And this leads us to the third important lesson in this passage, that God judges sin. Notice what happened next. Look at verse 27. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. We're not told who this man of God was. No name is given. We're not told where he came from, but here God sends a servant of his to Eli, the senior pastor, with a message. Interesting, he sent him to Eli, not to his sons. And as we review this message, there's a clear logic to it. This man of God, first of all, reminds Eli of what God had done for him and for them in the past. And then he focuses on what Eli and his sons were doing. And then he says, and now this is what God is gonna do as a result of that. And then there's a surprise, wonderful little promise at the end. 
So let's look at it quickly. First of all, look at what the Lord had done in the past for the house of Eli. Verse 27. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, Levi, the the priestly tribe chosen by God. Eli and his sons were part of that, uh, that family of the people of Israel. I chose him to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense and to wear an ephod in my presence. That was the priestly garment. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made by fire, to the, made with fire by the Israelites. Now, I don't have time to unpack what all of that means, but essentially, God is saying to, to Eli through this prophet through this messenger. I revealed myself in grace. I chose you in grace. I gave to you in grace. It was grace upon grace upon grace. It was blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And God's grace is always designed to lead us to two things. It's designed to lead us to gratitude and to godliness. We'll see more of that when we finish this series and we come back to Romans and we, we finish the first, chapter, first 11 chapters of Romans that focus on the amazing grace of God in our justification. And when we come to chapter 12, verse 1, and through to the end of Romans, God is saying, because of my grace, I want to see gratefulness in you and I want to see godliness in you. That's what God expects. If you have experienced the grace of God, God expects gratitude and he expects godliness. And God says to Eli, I have shown grace to you. Where is the gratitude? Where is the godliness? That's what God had done. Then he goes on to speak about what the house of Eli had done. Look at verse 29. He says to him, why do you scorn? The Hebrew word there is a strong word. It literally means to kick. Why do you kick my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? What a stinging rebuke. Serious accusation. Since Eli allowed his son's abuse of and contempt for the Lord's worship to continue, God says, you were honoring your sons more than me. You were putting them above me. And it seems from the second question in verse 29, look at it. Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? It seems that God is saying to Eli, you, you not only were aware of what they were doing, but you participated. You enjoyed the choice parts. You, in, you enjoyed those little lamb chops with the fat on the outside. And when you had the family bry and your sons brought meat for the bry, and you said to them, hey boys, where did you get this meat? And they said, well, you know, we got it from people who brought it to sacrifice. And he said, oh, I don't know if I should do that. And the boy said, oh, come on, pop, have a chop, you know. And he did. And he did. And he showed contempt along with his sons. He knew what the law said. He knew that that belonged to God. And yet he participated took that which rightfully belonged to God. Ralph Davis again, the man of God rebukes the sweet reasonableness, the willingness to tolerate sin, to allow God's honor to take a back seat, to prefer my boys to my God. For Eli, blood was thicker than faithfulness. There is a truth here even for the individual believer. The prophecy against Eli 
emphasizes that you can end up in grave sin by thinking it's very important to be nice to people. How easy it is to practice gutless compassion that never wants to offend anyone, that equates niceness with love and thereby ignores God's law and despises his holiness. We do not necessarily seek God's honor when we spare human feelings. I was cut to the heart by that because I, with my personality, I have a tendency to be too kind to people. I have a tendency to be soft when I should be tough. And I have failed my fellow believers at times by being a bit Eli-ish by being too nice and thereby not honoring God. And I've needed to repent of that and I probably still do. How concerned am I? How concerned are you for the honor of God? Are we more concerned about being liked than we are about God being honored. Before we leave this point, maybe a word to parents is necessary. As I was studying this passage, I asked myself, when did Hophni's and Phineas' rebellion start? Did it start when they became priests? I don't think so. I think it started when they were children. And we're given a hint of it in chapter three, verse 13. If we can just trespass over into next week's passage just quickly. Chapter three, verse 13. God says, for I told him, told Eli, that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. And then this, his sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. See, his sons made themselves contemptible and he, the father, Eli, failed to restrain them. And his failure to restrain them didn't begin when they pilfered the offerings and slept with the woman who worked at the tabernacle. His failure to restrain them began when they were little boys. When he didn't have the guts to restrain them. When he was too nice a dad to restrain them. When I think of that word restrain, I think of a puppy being trained. You've maybe done some puppy training. A puppy on a leash with a choker chain. Now, if you were gonna train that puppy so that they become a pleasure rather than a pain, you have to be willing to jerk the chain and hurt the puppy, right? Now, I'm not saying abuse. I'm not talking about swinging the puppy around on the ends of a chain and hitting it against trees. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about, uh, oh, oh, oh. Eli failed to do that. He was a wimp as a father. And he paid for it. And his sons paid for it. And Israel paid for it. And I see parents all the time who don't know how to jerk the chain when they should. And they pay for it. And worse still, their children pay for it. This is time for a parent check because it is so, so important. Look at what the Lord is gonna do. Therefore, verse 30, that's an ominous that word there has an ominous ring. The behavior of Eli and his sons will now meet the judgment of God. Therefore, verse 30, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me. Things are gonna change change. 
God says, those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house so there will not be an old man in your family line and you will, de- you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel and you will... St- Although good will be done to Israel, in your family line, there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I do not cut off from my altar will be spared only to blind your eyes with tears and to grieve your heart and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And then verse 34, God says, and what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be a sign will be a sign. And what was the sign? They will both die on the same day. And a few chapters down, we see that happening. Eli's two sons die on the same day as a sign. And everything else, every other bit of judgment that God had predicted through that man of God Every other thing came to pass. And if I had time, we could take you to scripture after scripture, right the way through to the reign of David, where that came about. But the future was not all bleak. For the man of God announced in verse 35 that God would raise up a faithful priest. He would remove Eli and his sons, but he would raise up a faithful priest who would please God's heart and do God's will. And the immediate reference, don't have time to unpack it, the immediate reference is to a a priest by the name of Zadok from a different Levitical line who became a, a godly priest. And then ultimately, it's a pointer to Jesus Christ, our great high priest who was not of the tribe of Levi, but of the tribe of Judah. But as Hebrews tells us, was confirmed by God to be high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, the final lesson in the passage is most encouraging. I'm just gonna highlight it here and we'll unpack it next week. Here is the final lesson in this section, verse 12 to 36. God graciously places holy people in corrupt situations to be instruments of reformation. There were scoundrels in Shiloh who brought great dishonor to the name of God and did great damage to his people. But into that corrupt situation, into that cesspool of Shiloh, God placed a servant in the form of the boy Samuel, a boy miraculously given to Hannah by God, a boy sacrificially dedicated to God by Hannah, a boy that would be God's instrument of reformation. Such is the grace of God. And interspersed throughout this messy account of the situation in Shiloh, we read these words about Samuel. Look at the text with me, verse 11. In the midst of the cesspool, in the midst of the mess, here we read it. But the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Verse 18, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. And there's a great little picture in this passage of his mother, Hannah, coming to visit him once a year. And each each year as he grew, she brought him a new little priestly robe and they got bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually it was the man's size that she brought to him. Verse 26, and the boy continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. And if you know Luke's gospel, those very words with one addition were said about the Lord Jesus. The boy continued to grow in stature and in favor with God and with the people. What was God doing? He, in his grace, he placed in the mess a man of God. Chapter three, verse one, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. So in the midst of the, in the, midst of the mess, 
God was at work in the most unlikely way through a boy. Now in the late, the late 14th century, it was a very, very dark time in the history of the church. The church was theologically adrift and morally corrupt. Its leaders were exploiting the poor and the ignorant by selling things called indulgences, which they claimed would give the people who bought these indulgences a ticket to heaven. And, if you, and you could even buy an indulgence for a deceased relative who was suffering in purgatory. And by buying an indulgence on their behalf, you could secure their exit from purgatory. As they had been scoundrels in Shiloh, toward the end of the 14th century, they were scoundrels in Rome. And then, on the 10th of November, 1483, a baby boy was born in the little German town of Eisleben. His parents named him Martin for the simple reason that he was born on St. Martin's Day in the Catholic Church. It is said that his father prayed aloud at his bedside as a newborn son, asking God to give him grace so that he might be known for his piety and for his learning. And God answered that prayer. And that little boy grew to be a man who through the scriptures alone came to understand salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And it was his clear and courageous teaching as a monk in his early 30s that sparked the Protestant Reformation that changed the world forever and has changed our lives. On the 31st of October, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. And the Lord used those 95 theses that truth that he summarized, that truth that stood in stark contrast to the error and to the corruption all around him in the church, God used that to spark the Protestant Reformation. And on the 31st of October this year, we celebrate 500 years since that day when Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the church door. And as he had done in the case of Samuel, God graciously placed Martin Luther as a young man in a church riddled with error and full of corruption to be his instrument of reformation. And God continues to bring about reformation in his church, often through the most unlikely people, in the most unlikely ways, for his greater glory and for the good of the gospel. And so today, as we look at our nation, as we look at the state of the church, we cry, Lord, do it again. Give us godly leaders steeped in the word of God, filled with the spirit of God, 
who will be instruments of reformation. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we thank you for your grace in giving Samuel to the nation of Israel at that time. And as we shall see the reformation that you brought about through his ministry, we will be amazed at your grace. Thank you for giving Martin Luther to the world at that time and for the benefits of understanding of the gospel that we enjoy today because of the clarity and the courage with which he communicated your holy gospel. Grant, Lord, that today, in our day, this church and your church in many places would be instruments of reformation as we take your word seriously, dealing with sin, holding on to truth, and proclaiming the gospel. We ask this for your glory. Amen.